ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Um, today's uh, little talk is, this is not a uh, formal lecture, just, uh, a, you know, Chuck asked uh, Brett and I to put out some pieces from our collection. Again, not a formal formal lecture, and we just heard a really awesome lecture by, by Marcus, and maybe uh, this, this early material could be the, uh, the, the topic or the focus of a lecture in the future, but certainly not today. Um, what we did was we put out 13 different groups of sword fittings that were all made prior to about the year 1600. Um, Brett has a very extensive collection and he brought some of his early pieces. Um, my collection is only, uh, say, Kamakura through Momoyama. Um, so when we, we think about these works, um, we have to think first physically, you know, what, uh, what's taking place. Swords are used for slashing as well as stabbing. And for them to uh, effectively slash, you really need to know where your, the position of your, handling, your, your hands are on the, uh, the tzka. So one of the uh, uh, purposes of the suba is so that you know where your hands are for slashing. And then from, for stabbing, when you're trying to push the sword into or through someone, you want to make sure that your you, your hands aren't slipping onto the blade. Obviously, you're trying to get into that person. They're probably wearing armor. You're trying to get into it. So, again, it's to prevent the hand from moving on the uh, down the blade and, and cutting cutting yourself. When we talk about these works, uh, the edges are referred to the nimi, and the inner inner area here is referred to as the ji the jiita or the hiraji or the hira, many different words. Then you have the uh, the nakago ana or the, the hole through which the nakago or the tang of the sword fits. In the case of many pieces up here, you'll have a kogai ana and a kozuka ana or they're called hitsu ana. If it's got two, it's called yo hitsu ana or both or a pair of hitsu ana. Um, and then the, uh, the Cutouts are called tsukashi. So if it's a hana tsukashi, it's a flower cutout. Um, so a few of the earlier pieces that we have here are ko kotosho and kokachushi. Now, if we think of, you know, in, in the early days, a sword might have been had the same monetary value as, you know, a fine <coughs> automobile, and armor might have had the same monetary value as, say, a house today. Um, if a person is starting out in one of these trades, the first thing they're not going to do is start out by creating a, their own armor or their own sword. So they've got to start somewhere, right? So folks that were working, um, if you started to work for a swordsmith or an armor smith, um, you know, you're going to start off by spending a year or two cutting charcoal. And then when you show you can do a good job with that, they're going to, you know, maybe let you become a hammerman or something like that. Something simple. Um, at some point, you might get a chance to start working on your own pieces, which you know you're going to start off with a sim something simplistic as a suba. So if you wanted if you wanted to be a sword maker when you grew up, you started out becoming maybe a, a tosho suba uh, maker. And we we should also keep in mind that early sword makers they made not only their sword blades, they also made their own habakis. They also made their own uh, suba. And if you go to um, Mishima Omishima Jinja uh, outside uh, Ehime Prefecture, where they have this amazing collection of Japanese swords, all donated to the shrine prior to the end of the Nanbokucho period. All of those, 80%, 85% of those swords, they all have their original iron habaki on them, which is really cool. Um, kachushi, we're, we're calling them, so these are Kachu means armor, she means the, the maker of, so Kachushi is the maker of early armor suba. Um, ko, the prefix, just means old, so if you hear folks in the field talk about Kotosho, Kokachushi, Ko Umetada, anything Ko, usually it, Ko means early, and it usually means prior to the year 1600. Um, we also have a couple works here by uh, Tachi Kanagushi, and uh, a ka kanagu is a, soft, a small metal fitting. Uh, so tachi kanagushi is a, a genre of uh, fittings that 
um, were made, usually the Tachi Kanagushi was one artisan who made all of the fittings, all of the metal fittings on the blade. So it was en suite, so to speak. And they called it um, Isaku Goshirai, which is uh, one complete set of, of uh, metal fittings for the Koshirai. We also have um, one group or two pieces here, uh, Kagamishi. Uh, kaga, uh, kagami means mirror, and a kaga, Kagamishi is a mirror maker suga. Um, of course, in Japan, they have the three imperial regalia, which are the jewel, the sword, and the mirror, um, things that came from China, uh, along with Buddhism. And uh, so Kagamishi suga are relatively rare. I've got one piece here that we can talk about a little bit later. Um, this other work, I'm not sure it really doesn't fit into a, a, a category very uh, cleanly. I actually, I sent this to the MBTHK and it came back as Horyu, as in they could not make a judgment on it, but it's an interesting piece we can talk about. Mm. Then around, I think it was 1437 were the first coins, uh, uh, brass coins that came from China into Japan. And it was shortly after that, say 30 years later, we started to see Onin uh, Tsuba. Uh, these were, you know, they, there's, a, there's some talk about that, you know, it was around the Onin Senso or the, the Onin War that we started to see these, but it seems that there's probably maybe a 150 or 200 year range that you could see some of the early ones. I've got <clears throat> one piece here that I think is extremely early. The, uh, the Tenzogon is, is very wide. Um, and then we have some pieces like this one here where the Tenzogon or the, the pointal brass inlay are very small. They may be a little bit uh, later. We've got uh, Kamakura Bori Suba. Um, they're not Kamakura period, and they're also not related to uh, the city of Kamakura. But um, there's a particular kind of uh, carving called Kamakura Bori, which uh, these Suba tend to mimic. The characteristics of these are uh, they're medium size. Uh, for the most part, uh, suba over say six point, uh, seven point eight centimeters and larger are for daito for long swords, and smaller than that uh, are for shoto or short swords. You will not see any kama. You, I've never seen a kamakura bori suba that is for shoto for a wakizashi or or a tanto. So for the most part, they're large. Uh, say 7.8, usually up to maybe 8.4, something like that. They're relatively uh, thin, two millimeters. And many of them have um, a pattern on it with a temple, a mountain, a bridge, a river. And this is a, a pattern that was taken um, from Chinese paintings. We've got Ko Umetada, that genre of, uh, of makers. Um, Umetara Myoju, as we all, all sword people here, um, was a sword maker, but that word Umetara was associated with metal workers in, in Kyoto prior to Umetara Myoju living. Um, and then he became, like today if we say uh, Umetara, we normally associate the name with that famous sword maker, who was also obviously a fittings maker. And he's also the only uh, maker who has Juyo Bunkazai and Juyo Bujutsuhin, as well as uh, Tokubetsu Juyo Token and Tokubetsu Juyo Kosogu, the only person that has it in both categories, all, all categories, both sword as well as fitting, which is, is kind of interesting. But what, something else that I've noticed is um, if, if a work is not Mino and it's not Goto and it was made in Kyoto, they call it Ko Umetara, and if it was made outside Kyoto, or they believe it was made outside Kyoto, they call it Kokinko. We have another section over there called Kokinko. Actually, it's right, right here. Uh, next to Ko Umetara, we've got uh, Kanayama, and uh, th there's a bit of uh, contradictory information that we have about Kanayama. Some some teachers believe that. Uh, because close to Owari, there was another town called Kaneyama, and we're not sure if Kaneyama was a person or uh, referring to the place that's near Owari. Um, 
for the most part, there is a, um, there's sort of a, a stepped hierarchy of, uh, of works in this, in this area. They call it some Owari, others Owari Kaneyama, and then if, it, if it's better, they'll call it Den Kaneyama, or if it's really good, we've got one good piece here, uh, they'll, they'll call it Kaneyama. And we've got one piece that I think would probably pay for to, to Kaneyama. Again, this, the talk today is not meant to be a very in-depth conversation, but just a sort of high level. We've got some really excellent uh, Kinko works here. One is Juyo uh, that belongs to Chuck. You really should take a good close look at that. Um, then we've got the natural extension from Onin. You know, most you know, Onin work, well, Onin works were made in Kyoto. And as time went on, for the most part, the, um, the Onin works were pointal inlay, so tenzogon. They were senzogon, or linear inlay, as well as uh, hirazogon, uh, suemo zogon, which are sort of wider pieces of, of brass that were inlaid into the, uh, the, the, the iron. Later on, uh, the Heianjo tradition uh, had more, there was linear inlay as well as uh, wider pieces of flat. Uh, Suemon was, was inlaid into the, uh, the face of the iron plate. We've got Kosho Ami, which is another genre. Um, when you hear Ami in a name, for the most part, there's an association with uh, the religious movements, the, you know, temples. That are around uh, around Japan. Uh, in Japan, of course, they used the guild system to control the way that raw materials were used, whether it was charcoal, iron, or any of the soft metals. So there was pretty strict control over these materials. Um, and obviously, the, the temples and shrines they had control over these areas. So they uh, that the Koshoami uh, tradition or the Shoami tradition. Um, they tend to, tended to be sort of all around, not centralized around Kyoto or centralized around Owari. In the case of uh, Kamakuribori, scholars believe that most Kamakuribori pieces were made around Odawara, but, and then of course K Kotosho and Kokachushi uh, would have been made all around, wherever the sword makers or the armor makers would have been. And finally, we have Miochin and Saotome. Now, the Miochin family, they're a family of armor makers. They've been working since Kamakura times. Um, so we have signed, you know, signed uh, helmets that are signed Miochin. Also related uh, to Sa the Saotome school, we have, again, armor and, and helmets that are signed Saotome. And each, each of these groups, they have sort of um, characteristics. Uh, the, the Sao Tome usually have a little bit of a, a rise toward the Mimi. That's one of the one of the ways that you can uh, can conte them. Uh, anyway, I mean we've got about there have to be sixty uh, suba here, all prior to sixteen hundred. Chuck mentioned that this should be a, you know relatively short little talk, not necessarily a, a detailed lecture. But uh, Brett and I are going to be here all day, and we're happy to answer any of the questions that you have about the works. Um, I will say that when looking at the suba in context of uh, you know, what they are and what they're, tr what they're trying to represent, we should keep in mind that you know, most, of, most of the guards have to do with one of two things. One is identification. So it's what is what uh, family or clan are you representing? Um, also, are you uh, a supporter of the emperor, or are you a supporter of uh, a, a particular daimyo or shogun? Um, and then the other uh, big area is it's, it's religious. It's one of the two uh, religions in Japan. It's either Shinto, which they say is a, a, the indigenous religion of Japan, but in actuality, it's related to continental Taoism. So, but it, it went to Japan probably you know four four or five thousand years ago so they calling it they call it a um, an indigenous religion but also uh, so many pieces are related to say uh, Shinto the Shinto religion like you have uh, let's see
There it is. Here is a Shinto altar piece. This is called a uh, shide. So four pieces of white paper on each side. And uh, so this, the, the, the bushi that was taking this into battle, he was basically taking part of a, uh, a Shinto altar with him uh, to the battlefield. Shinto is uh, a philosophic, you know, a philosophy or a religion that is basically um, uh, revolves around nature worship. They believe that the, the nature of the, the kami is in the water, the wind, the sea, uh, wood, stone. Um, and it also um, sometimes expresses itself in animals. A lot of the animals uh, that are uh, uh, seen in, in sword fittings have something to do uh, with, uh, with the Shinto religion. And then Buddhism. Now Buddhism is you know, an old religion 2,500 years ago, started in, obviously in, in India. And when it came to Japan in about the sixth, seventh, seventh century, it brought uh, with it the written language, uh, the techniques to, to smelt many types of metals, swords came along with it. Um, and the philosophy of uh, giving up one's life for, see that the, um, the focus of the Buddhist religion is uh, that they believe that suffering is caused by desire. So if you can do away with your desire for wealth, status, what have you, you can achieve enlightenment. So a lot of the, uh, the uh, iconography that's on the Suba has something to do with using your life uh, as a tool for salvation, or in India they call it nirvana, in Japanese they call it satori, but a lot of, I'd say, mo you know, the overwhelming majority of um, iconography that's on the suva has something to do with uh, Buddhism or, Shin or Shintoism, and has something to do with using life as a tool to realize um, en enlightenment. And with that, maybe we'll We'll close the, the beginning of the talk and you know if anybody has any questions about specific pieces I'm happy to, to, to talk to them Robert I have a question what is this big piece over there right uh, sure maybe yeah, you can so show it to everybody yeah this it's a is, um, so this is a Miochian a Miochian guard it's the largest Tsuba that I've ever seen in the States or in Japan um, so late Muromachi early Momoyama times, you know, you had the, uh, the Dutch and Portuguese traders were coming to Japan. They brought firearms, firearms. They didn't have smokeless powder at the time. So if they were using firearms on the battlefield, uh, there was a great deal of smoke. So with, with smoke, and you needed to quickly understand who was friend and foe, uh, in the arm in the world of armor they had those kawadi kabuto or those giant really you know outlandish helmets they say because of the the smoke on the battlefield that they started using these also maybe um a bit influenced by the dutch and portuguese uh, clothing that they that, that they witnessed and um so this suba would have been worn uh on a katana and you would have you know whoever wore this they would have immediately uh, known if it's friend or foe, because this is a pretty memorable, memorable suba. Um, and this has been papered by the MBTHK, um, and they called it uh, Kawari, Kawari Gata, or uh, of an interesting shape, and they, they papered it to the Myochin school. So this was made by, you know, in, in the tradition of an armorsmith. And we can see that, uh, Around the uh, sepa die, we can see these four points, and these are ken, the, they're the, the point of a sword. And also, the more I look at this, I think these, so it's, it's got four lobes to it, and I think each one of the lobes has got, uh, I think this is a kuagata. So when you see um, a helmet and you see those two kind of uh, edifices that come up like this, those are called kuagata. And I think uh, each of these lobes 
forms a coup about that, which is kind of interesting. Other questions? Uh, here's an interesting pair, the smaller of which came from the collection of Robert, Robert Bob Haynes. And uh, so Kyoto had a relationship with Kaga and some of the uh, Kaga metal workers uh, learned uh, from the Kaga Yoshio and uh, we can see similarities with, with Hei Anjo but uh, one of them has a, a Hitsuana that's sort of elongated and many of the uh, many teachers believe that this is one of the characteristics of earlier pieces <laughs> what else is notable got a really good, uh, a really fine um, called Unetada uh, Suva that we can take a look at. And uh, the, uh, the theme here is grape, grape leaves. You can see grape leaves going around it. And uh, it's a bit of an onomatopoeia because grapes uh, in Japanese are called budo. And that, that phonetic budo uh, also means the way of the warrior. So why, why would you know, a warrior walk around wearing a suva with grape leaves on it. Not because he liked grapes, but because, you know, it's uh, ph uh, phonetically, it sounds like the word budo or the way of a warrior. A um, couple other works that are similar. Here's one. So here's a kokagamishi piece, uh, sorry, kokachushi piece, um, and it has a, uh, a pine needle. You'd say, well, you know, what's the story with this bushi, this warrior? Why would he put a pine needle on his uh, on his suba? And the reason is, uh, so in Japanese you have onyomi and kunyomi, two pronunciations. One is matsu, which means pine. The other is sho, but sho has two mean. Uh, phonetically, sho means to win. So that's why. Uh, that iconography was put on this this piece. There's another one too that, that comes to mind. Um, where is it? Here's another one. So this uh, this is another early Kokachushi uh, piece, and this one has uh, a dragonfly on it. Again. These, uh, they, they were not interested in the bug itself, but the fact that it's called a kachimushi, katsu or kachi, means to win. So that's why they chose this particular iconography for the, for the suva. Uh, maybe we'll pick, pick a last one. Here's an, a really fine onin example that has a gorinto on it. Gorinto is um, is a basically a funeral a grave marker, and it has five five pieces to it that represent each of the five uh, elements, and uh, so this is a constant reminder of the job of of the bushi, the, the warrior or the samurai. Um, it's a constant reminder that at any at any one given moment they might be asked to give up their life for uh, the person that they serve. And indeed, the word uh, samurai, the, the character that came from, you know, the Chinese character means to serve. So constant reminder that you may be called on uh, to serve your daimyo or the one that you're defending. Um, also, in many cases with these, you'll see something that comes from nature. This is, again, it's related to uh, Shinto, the Shinto religion mushrooms you know was this guy a, a gourmet no so why why did why would you put mushrooms on your suba and they looked at these things in nature and they were fascinated by them and they said well let's think about a mushroom it can provide you with sustenance uh, they grow very quickly overnight they don't have any roots which something that they thought was amazing and they also had the power to kill someone pretty instantly. So they wanted to take on some of that power. Um, 
So it was kind of many, many of these works, they were used as talisman or as good luck charms, kind of like the way that we might wear you know, a crucifix around our neck or something like that. So each of the pieces has a story to tell. There's, there's a backstory on all of them. Um, but what it is, you know, it, it's our job as students to understand what is the backstory to each of the pieces. Um, so with that, maybe we'll conclude. Thank you.